In his award-winning book, Cop in the Hood, Professor Peter Moskos, a Harvard-trained sociologist, describes what it was like to work as a police officer in Baltimore's Eastern District. As a young, new police officer, Moskos was placed in the Eastern District, which is a very high crime area. In his book, Moskos contends that when officers are fresh out of the academy, they are usually placed in these types of high crime districts, since these areas are considered to be the least desirable to work. So in a sense, the ghetto becomes a real-life training area. As an Ivy League graduate student, Moscos decided to embark on an in-depth participant observation project. As luck would have it, a new police commissioner with the Baltimore Police Department permitted Moscos to become a fully paid police officer. The commissioner was aware of Moscos' status as a researcher, nevertheless, Moscos was put through an expedited background check where he would later be sent to the academy and ultimately becoming a police officer. Interestingly, Moscos admits in his book that he successfully deceived the polygrapher during his background check. He admits to lying, however, he never specifies exactly what he was untruthful about during the polygraph exam. Some of Moscos' fellow officers would also confide to him that they, too, responded untruthfully to questions during the polygraph exam. Once Moscos passed the background check, he spent six months in the police academy and would eventually be an active officer for 14 months. This participant observational study would become his doctoral dissertation and would later culminate in this book. In his book, Moscos reflects upon his experiences in the police academy. He writes, the academy environment is less a learning process than a ritualized hazing environment. He also argues that the primary purpose of the police academy was to protect the department from the legal liability that could result from negligent training claims. In order to meet the 502 Maryland mandated training objectives, classes were taught to the tests. Moscos writes that neither he nor any of his fellow police trainees were challenged by any of the class material, with perhaps the exception of a few legal classes. Moscos was also taught the basics of report writing. And after graduating from the academy and working for 16 months as a police officer, Moscos writes that even without resorting to perjury, officers have tremendous leeway and discretion in their report writing. Moscos contends that in the police academy, trainees are instructed how to use the Terry Frisk to make drug lockups. Trainees were taught in the academy how to articulate the legal standards necessary to justify these searches. Technically, a Terry Frisk may only be used to find weapons, but as Moscos explains, any contraband in plain view or plain feel is fair game, even if the found object was not the original goal. Upon successfully completing the academy, Moscos would spend two months in field training. Here, a senior officer would patrol with greenhorn trainees such as Moscos. The senior officer would receive about $12 extra per shift to work with the new trainees. During this time, Moscos had a badge and a gun, but he was still considered to be a trainee. It is important to point out that as a cop researcher, Moscos did not pick either his research subjects or research site. Rather, he conducted research where he was assigned to work as a police officer. The officers he worked with became his friends as well as his research subjects. He constantly took notes and ultimately filled up about 350 single space tight pages of notes. He conducted recorded interviews with his fellow officers and also had numerous non-recorded conversations. Interestingly, he was able to collect more information in these casual conversations. One of Moscow's initial observations was that police generally couched their hatred in terms of class and culture, not race. 
For example, it was not uncommon for officers to make distinctions among African Americans. Several other officers also acknowledged that the Eastern District was an arrest free for all. Officers admitted that if they wanted to make overtime by appearing in court, they merely needed to make an arrest. Moscos writes that the decision to arrest or not arrest those involved in drugs becomes more a matter of personal choice and officer discretion than any formalized police response toward crime or public safety. The nature of Moscos' in-depth project allowed him to make countless other observations of police culture. In his book, Cop in the Hood, Peter Moskos writes that he did not go out of his way to seek adventure or make arrests during his 14th month tenure as a Baltimore police officer. He contends that he made between zero and eight arrests per month, which was lower than many rookie officers but tended to be higher than most veteran officers. Moskos saw quite a bit of action while working in the Eastern District. In his police duties, he removed his gun from its holster probably every other shift. During his tenure as a police officer, five of Moscow's fellow Baltimore police officers were killed in the line of duty. A year after Moscow's quit the force, one of his close friends and academy classmates was also killed in the line of duty. The area that Peter Moscow's worked was the Eastern District, one of nine districts in Baltimore City. According to Moscos, this area suffers from crime, drugs, and blight. It is 97% African American and has a poverty rate of 37%. The Eastern District's 45,000 residents also accounted for 20,000 arrests every year. Most of these arrests, as he explains in his book, were drug-related. Moscos worked the night shift, where there was an almost non-existent upper management presence. He would often patrol solo without a partner, but of course there were also nights when Moscos would be assigned a partner. Moscos is also a very affable individual, and he would often share a beer with his fellow officers after work. This not only helped him establish rapport with his subjects, it also occasionally led to interesting information. Moscos' book is interesting because he managed to get several police officers to admit to engaging in conduct that some may consider to be unprofessional. For example, one of his police officers that he questioned admitted freely to taking naps while on duty. Moscos himself admits in the book that he enjoyed taking naps on a quiet midnight shift. In fact, he insinuates that all of his co-workers did this. Moscos also contends that even though it is legally questionable, police officers almost always have something they can use to lock up somebody just because. For example, Moscos argued that he could arrest someone for loitering. Repeated arrests for loitering, especially if no drugs are found, could easily result in a complaint about police racism and harassment to internal affairs. Nevertheless, Moscos contends that these arrests are used by police to assert authority or get criminals off the street. Once the word was out that Moscos and his fellow officers were not afraid to make arrests, it was not unusual for the suspects to disperse without even being asked. They would walk away as soon as the patrol car, car emerged, which was considered to be a sign of respect. Moscos also writes that officers routinely overlooked drug offenses. For example, he discusses one instance where one of his fellow officers found a suspect with one pill of heroin and a hypodermic needle. It was at the end of the shift and the officer wanted to go home. The officer asked his other cop friends whether anyone wanted to take the arrest and get the overtime. With no takers, the officer kicked the needle and pill into the gutter and crushed them with his boots. The officer ordered the addict to go home and then drove off in his patrol car. Moscos writes that officers would routinely destroy illegal drugs by stepping on them. Otherwise, if they confiscated the drugs, they would have to, to write a found property report 
which would take roughly 45 minutes, time that could otherwise be spent patrolling the streets. Even though Moscos admits that an officer's actions in destroying drugs and failing to make to arrest a man guilty of drug possession are punishable at the department and perhaps even criminal level, he nevertheless defends this practice in his book. In fact, he argues that when an officer takes it upon himself to destroy drugs, this actually makes financial and moral sense. Moscos argues that placing the addict in the criminal justice system will not give him the help he needs, and he contends that proper drug submission would cost the city needless overtime pay and increase the opportunity for corruption. The irony, however, is that even though officers may be doing what they feel is right given the situation, they are nevertheless technically violating their oath to uphold the laws of the land any time they crush drugs. It is apparent from reading this book, I think, that Moscos became intimately familiar with the illegal drug trade in inner city Baltimore. Moscos points out how violent the illicit drug world is in Baltimore. He argues that more than 10% of the men in Baltimore's Eastern District are murdered before the age of 35. And he attributes this to the astounding risk of death to those who are employed in the illegal drug business. Moscos observes in his book that one of the cardinal rules of drug dealing is to keep the money and the drugs separate. There are distinct jobs, according to Moscos, within the world of street corner drug dealing. For example, he argues that a lookout is the lowest job in the drug dealing operation. Almost always an addict will be a lookout, and he has the simple job of alerting others when the police are approaching. A lookout will make about $35 to $50, according to Moscos, and he's usually paid in drugs. There is also the money man or the banker who holds the money, and therefore he has some position of responsibility. A customer will arrange the type, price, and quantity with the money man, according to Moscos. Most street-level transactions are for $10 or $20, and a good banker takes the money and he holds no drugs. Holding the money itself is not a crime, but when a person is arrested with money and drugs, the money may be seized under civil forfeiture laws. In his book, Cop in the Hood, Moscow also argues that overdoses, ironically, are actually good for business. So if someone ODs on a drug, then the word gets out that the drug is strong and pure, and this actually drives up sales.